Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Srimad Bhagavatam. Ripened fruit of the tree of wisdom of all Vedic knowledge. Translated with commentary by His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. Founder Acharya of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. <laughs> so, <clears throat> we've been reading in Canto 5, Chapter 19, and now we're on Text 13, and we're hearing how the different residents of the different areas in Jambadweep approach the Lord and offer their prayers and um, glorify Him. They're sharing their Krishna consciousness with us via Sukadev Goswami, his conversation with Maharaj Pariksit. Sukadev is describing all of this. So now we're hearing about Bharata Varsha which is understood to be India, and <clears throat> it's understood that thousands and thousands of years ago, Bharata Varsa referred to the entire planet, not just to the small country now that is referred to as India, and that the position of India is to lead and guide the rest of the world, Bharata Varsa. So, this Sankirtan movement of Lord Chaitanya is meant to revive the Krishna consciousness on the planet, and it's going to be coming out of Bharata Varsa. And it is coming out of Bharata Varsa via Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, spreading this Hare Krishna Maha Mantra all over the planet, every town and village, re establishing the um, leadership the spiritual guidance of uh, the devotees of the Lord. Bharata Varsa is very, very significant. <clears throat> it's the land of Krishna. So, it's interesting that in previous times said that the demons and the demigods were always in conflict with each other because the devotees are trying, the, the demigods, they're servants of the Lord and the demons are inimical. They want to they want to control things in their own way. So <clears throat> there's always a conflict and um, in previous times they were situated on different planets and as the ages progress in cosmic time very large scale compared to our lifespan, cosmic time. As the ages progressed, the demons were on the same planet with the devotees, and the conflict was taking place between countries and tracts of land. And then, now in the Kali Yuga, the demons the, div the divine and the demonic is within each individual. So the disease has, has progressed to such a point it has metastasized. <laughs> it's like cancer starts in one little area and then it spreads throughout the entire body and goes into every organ and every cell. It just metastasizes <clears throat> and it's fatal. So this Sankirtan movement is meant to stop this metastasizing of the demoniac um, spirit, demoniac nature, which is, in this age of Kali Yuga, is very, very widespread. So much so that the divine and the demonic are within each individual. So the fighting doesn't go on between interplanetary and it doesn't go on between countries and continents. The fighting and the struggle is now within each individual. 
in the weapon, and especially the Maha Mantra. Krishna himself defeats the demoniac nature in the form of the holy name, hearing and chanting. So, Srimad Bhagavatam, chanting the glories of the Lord for no other purpose than to glorify the Lord. Devotional service, devoid of any material consideration. So, text 13, and the incarnation of the Lord that is <clears throat> recognized in Bhartavarsha is Naranarayan. Naranarayan. And the foremost devotee is Narada Muni. So, in uh, Kim Purusha Varsha, the form of the Lord is Ramachita Ram, and the foremost devotee is Hanuman. And in some of the other Varsas, there's, I believe it's Ilavrita Varsa, is uh, Matsya, and Vaivasvatamanu is the foremost devotee. So these are all pastimes of the Lord, his devotees. So here it's Naranarayan Rishi, and this is where we're situated. We're situated in, in Bharata Varsa, when we consider that the entire planet at one time is Bharata Varsa. And the foremost devotee is Narada Muni. So these are Narada's prayers. Continuation, he says. O oh my Lord, Master of all mystic yoga, this is the explanation of the yogic process spoken of by Lord Brahma, Hiranyagarbha, who is self-realized. At the time of death, all yogis give up material body with full detachment simply by placing their minds at your lotus feet. That is the perfection of yoga. And of all yogis, he who abides in me in devotional service is topmost. So, from the Gita. Prabhupada's commentary <clears throat> quotes from Srila Madhvacharya. Yasya samyag bhagavati jnanam bhakti tataivacha nishchintas tasya moksha shat sarva papa krito pitu. Translation. For one who very seriously practices devotional service during his lifetime, in order to understand the constitutional position of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, liberation from this material world is guaranteed, even if he has previously been addicted to sinful habits. <coughs> and this is confirmed in Bhagavad Gita. Apichet sudaracharo bhajate mamananyabhak Sadur eva samantavya samyag vyavasito hisa. Excuse me. In translation, even if one commits the most abominable actions, if he's engaged in devotional service, he's to be considered saintly because he's properly situated. The only purpose of life is to be fully absorbed in thoughts of Krishna and his form, pastimes, activities, and qualities. If one is able to think of Krishna in this way, 24 hours a day, he's already liberated, svarupena viafastiti, whereas materialists are absorbed in material thoughts and activities. Devotees, on the contrary, are always absorbed in thoughts of Krishna and Krishna's activities. Therefore, they are already on the path of liberation. One has to think of Krishna with full absorption at the time of death. Then he will certainly return home back to Godhead, without a doubt. <clears throat> so, the only purpose of life is to be fully absorbed in thoughts of Krishna and his form, pastimes, activities, and qualities. It's interesting that Shil the Prabhupada, in his commentary here, brings that makes that statement 
right after Apichet Siddharacharo, which says, even if one commits the most abominable actions, if he's engaged in devotional service, he's to be considered saintly because he's properly situated. So that would be nice to get some clarification on what those abominable actions are. For Arjuna, abominable actions would have been fighting in the battle of Kurukshetra <coughs> with the aim to kill his superiors, his teachers, his relatives. That would be abominable. But because it was under Krishna's direct instruction, Krishna's direct order, and he was engaged in devotional service to Krishna, this is he's properly situated. So abominable actions may not necessarily mean like breaking four regulative principles and doing something really hideous. Uh, <laughs> it may not be referring to those abominable actions. It may be more like what happened to Arjuna, where the Lord asked him to do something or something that needs to be done that ordinarily goes against either the etiquette or the code of behavior that's expected from someone in a higher consciousness of in someone who has a lot of responsibility. Or like in Chaitanya Lila, the servant Govinda. For him it was abominable to step over Lord Chaitanya. That, that's just unheard of. But Sri Krishna Chaitanya had dozed and he was lying in the doorway. And in order to serve the Lord, Govinda had to step over him. And it was something he wouldn't ordinarily do. But he couldn't do a service unless he did, so he did it. And to him that was abominable to step over the Lord. But to engage in devotional service he did it. And when it was time for him to take prasadam, he would have had to have stepped over the body of the Lord again, but this he didn't do. He wouldn't, in order to eat, he would not step over the Lord. So he sat there and fasted. And that was his service to the Lord. And similarly, with the, uh, you know, the residents of Vrindavan, the gopis, the village girls, <clears throat> They were so much enamored of Krishna, they didn't even think of him as the personality of Godhead. They just spontaneously, uh, irresistibly attracted to this beautiful, wonderful person. Just a uh, source of all their life energy, their pleasure, everything. Krishna was everything to them. And uh, there's the discussion of how Krishna, he had a headache and he said, the only thing that would relieve this headache was the dust of the feet of the devotees. But no one would give the dust. Uh, they were afraid. Oh, I can't get dust from my feet for Krishna's head? Oh, no, I, I can't do that. I'm not, I can't. When the gopis heard that the only thing Krishna said that would relieve his headache was the dust from the feet of a devotee, they gave dust like anything. Let us go to hell. We don't care. To serve Krishna, we're fine. Here, dust. You want dust? Here, here. Give the dust. And they kicked up a huge dust storm to <laughs> get rid of Krishna's headache so he wouldn't have a headache. So abominable here, we know it can be applied to in, that, in these situations where in order to engage in service, a devotee has to do something they ordinarily would consider simply abominable. That much we're safe in, in surmising out of this. So. We go on to text 14. And Narada Muni continues, materialists are generally very attached to their present bodily comforts and to the bodily comforts they expect in the future. Therefore, they're always absorbed in thoughts of their wives, children, wealth, and are afraid of giving up their bodies, which are full of stool and urine. 
If a person engaged in Krishna consciousness, however, is also afraid of giving up his body, what's the use of having labored to study the Shastras? It was simply a waste of time. The, uh, comes down to it, <clears throat> identification with the material body, which Narada tells us here is full of stool and urine. And materialists are understandably a- attached because they are seen with material vision. Uh, they have a ma- sense view of the world in terms of sense gratification, and the body is the vehicle. Material body is the vehicle, and because they have uh, no realization of their own spiritual nature, very, very fearful of losing the only thing that they're actually conscious of, which is their material covering. But here Narada says, if a person is engaged in Krishna consciousness and is afraid of giving up his body, what was the use of having studied the Shastras? It was a waste of time. So we can understand that's one of the um, results or outcomes that we can understand if we're getting the message properly is if we have fear of giving up the material body. And that giving up of the material body isn't always quickly. It can be very slowly uh, in a period of old age and progressive diseases. So sometimes people pray, if I have to go, let me go quickly. I just, I want to go to sleep and if it's time for me to go, then just let me go to sleep and not wake up. But that process of giving up the material body can be over a very long period of time. 20, 30 years of gradual um, debilitation, gradually losing the ability to move freely, gradually losing eyesight and hearing and the ability to eat and the teeth not losing the teeth, and it can be very gradual. And that's also very fearful, because that's the gradually losing the material body. It's gradually deteriorating. and So that can be very fearful. And for materialists, they'll do anything to try to counteract that. They'll pay any amount of money. They'll ex- even experiment with very dangerous so-called cures and chemicals and treatments to try to stave it off, and uh, since it's the cheaters and the cheated, there's all kinds of rascals out there promising these different cures and remedies. (laughs) So if a devotee still has that mentality, then they really haven't gotten the benefit that is available in the Shastras. They really haven't made that the necessary advancement to get beyond the material identification with the body. So you can expect that a devotee, although they may not be spared this gradual deterioration, because after all it's the way the body is and they're dealing with a material body, but if they're Krishna conscious their experience will be very different they'll be very different because each um, difficulty that comes will act as an impetus to take shelter of Krishna more and more. And although no one asks for these things, they'll be welcomed, knowing that this difficulty and this material the obstacle to the material body's sense gratification is freeing the spirit more and more to take shelter of Krishna, preparing more and more for dropping the body altogether, going back home. So it's a great blessing to be able to live through this gradual process. It can be a great blessing. You can welcome, welcome the difficulties. And Queen Kunti prays like that. Uh, more and more these difficulties were coming and they forced me to take shelter of you more and more. Whereas I was living a very comfortable, opulent position. I, yes, Krishna's very nice, but that intensity of 
taking shelter was not there. It's funny that intensity, intense desire is very much sought after by devotees. So much so that <clears throat> Narada um, glorifies Kamsa. Why? Kamsa was laser focused on Krishna, not in devotion, <clears throat> in fear and anger, fear, but his intensity, 24 hours a day, he couldn't stop thinking about Krishna. So Narada says he wishes that he had that intensity in devotion, not in animosity, but in devotion. So the intensity is, is turned up. It's like a, it's not an off and on switch for the light. It's like a dimmer switch, a brighter and a dimmer switch. And it gets turned up when these difficulties come for the material situation is faced with difficulties. That, that switch gets turned up brighter, more intense, more determined. So if that's not happening and someone's studying Shastra, they're just wasting their time. That should be happening, becoming more and more detached, less and less fearful of old age disease and ultimately death. She's becoming freed from that and coming closer and closer and closer in relationship, deriving the relationship with Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Prabhupada's commentary. At the time of death, a materialist thinks of his wife and children. He's absorbed in thinking of how they will live who will take care of them after he leaves. Consequently, he's never prepared to give up his body. Rather, he wants to continue to live in his body, to serve his society, family, friends, and so on. Therefore, by practicing mystic yoga system, one must become detached from bodily relationships. If despite practicing bhakti yoga and studying all Vedic literature, one is afraid of giving up his bad body, which is the cause of all his suffering, What's the use of attempts to advance in spiritual life? The secret of success in practicing yoga is to become free from bodily attachments. Srila Narottam Das Thakur says, translation, one, who practice, one whose practice has freed him from anxiety of bodily needs is no longer in conditional life. Such a person is freed from conditional bondage. A person in Krishna consciousness must fully discharge his devotional duties without material attachment. Then his liberation is guaranteed. So it's not that someone in devotional consciousness neglects family members or personal responsibilities and relationships, husband or wife or children or elderly parents. They they're not neglecting them. They're doing the needful and the necessary, and they show affection, natural affection, for another spirit soul, another servant of Krishna. Whether they realize they're a servant of Krishna or not, they are. If they're not realized and they're not striving to serve Krishna, then they're serving Krishna indirectly. They're asleep, but they're still serving. Everyone's serving Krishna. Actually, the pure devotee, is, is so humble, they're thinking everyone is serving Krishna, except for me. I can't see how I'm doing anything at all valuable to serve Krishna, whereas everyone else is, even those that are serving indirectly are serving Krishna better than me. <laughs> but that's a very elevated stage, it's extreme humility. So the devotee is not neglectful of their responsibilities, with their family members, or in their work situation. They have to maintain themselves somehow. <laughs> but they're detached. And they don't do their worldly responsibilities at the expense of their devotional activities. They maintain their devotional service. They're hearing, they're chanting, and they're remembering and whatever other forms of devotional service they can perform, worshiping, 
whatever they can do in terms of devotional service, is not sacrificed and, and replaced by their material uh, obligations to family members and duties and responsibilities. And that was the mistake uh, Maharaj Bharata made. Unfortunately, he sacrificed or he allowed his attachment when he was in the forest meditating and preparing to leave his body became attached to the deer. And he allowed that attachment to interfere with his devotional practices. We can say there was no, it wasn't some horrible thing that he did by rescuing a small helpless creature. He was the only one there that could do it. But he allowed that attachment to interfere with his devotional practices. So, in performing our duties, we don't want to do that. We want to maintain our devotional practices. See, a person in Krishna consciousness must discharge his devotional duties without material attachment. Text 15, Narada continues, Therefore, O Lord, O Transcendence, kindly help us by giving us the power to execute Bhakti Yoga so that we can control our restless minds and fix them upon you. We're all infected by your illusory energy. Therefore, we're very attached to the body, which is full of stool and urine, and to anything related with the body. Except for devotional service, there's no way to give up this attachment. Therefore, kindly bestow upon us this benediction. Mm-hmm. Yeah, devotional service is a different type of energy of the Lord. There's no material solution within ma- the material uh, energy. No amount of combinations or procedures or rearrangement uh, it's like rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. <laughs> That's not going to help, just rearranging the deck chairs on the, on the Titanic as it goes down. Oh, I rearranged the deck chairs. That's like trying to find a material solution to a material problem. And the material problems are very clear. Birth, death, old age, and disease. <laughs> and by being attached to the body and to other bodily relations, family and relatives. They're extensions of the bodily identification and trying to arrange for them material solutions also. It's just rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. The only solution is you get in the lifeboat and the Titanic's going to go down. The body is going to get old and die. If a person is fortunate, it will get old first before it dies. So you get in the lifeboat, which is the devotional service of the Lord, which rescues the living being from having to take another birth, to get aboard another Titanic, and go through it all over again. So it's a different type of energy, devotional energy, completely. The material energy is characterized by temporary. There's always a beginning and an end. It's illusory, has no real substance, doesn't last. The main feature of the material energy is that it, the forms have no permanence. In the very beginning of Bhagavatam, there is the verse about what appears to have substance but is not connected with the Supreme Personality of Godhead, which means devotional service, is illusory. And real knowledge means to be able to distinguish what is illusory, what is temporary, what, what has no permanence, and is very often referred to as a reflection of the reality reflected through the modes of material nature and the material energy. It's reflected there. 
when the Lord glances over the material substance, then these forms are agitated, the material nature is agitated, and these forms begin to appear. These illusory forms by the glance of the Lord. Under the direction of Lord Brahma, he, he's the engineer. He, manuf he manufactures and engineers these illusory forms to accommodate the living entity's <coughs> desires to engage with the material energy. So these material forms are have no permanence, no substance. And that's distinctly different from the spiritual forms, which are eternal, full of knowledge and bliss. No birth or death, no pain or suffering. They're full of knowledge and always engaged in devotional activities. Personality of Godhead in unlimited variegatedness unlimited pleasure, reservoir of pleasure, unlimited. A variety of forms, uniqueness, everywhere individual and unique. Uh, quite a panorama. <laughs> unlimited panorama, unlimited spectrum. So Narada is praying like that. He says, us, we are infected by your illusory energy. And there's no way to give up this attachment except for devotional service. Please kindly bestow upon us this benediction of devotional service. In the pastimes of Lord Chaitanya, reading from the Chaitanya Bhagavat, the Lord uh, is present in such a unique way. <laughs> he is presenting everything all at once in his form of Lord Chaitanya. He is so fully present. It is totally overwhelming. It's when the devotees and the associates at the time, they were, their hair was standing on end constantly. They were <laughs> overwhelmed by the Lord was revealing everything about himself. There's nothing it kept back. It's all there in Sri Krishna Chaitanya. And the ben he would ask them, Please ask for a benediction, and they would always ask for devotional service. And he was awarding devotional service, even to those who were not qualified, or who had, like Jaga and Mane, totally unqualified, committed so many sinful activities, the record of it was a mountain high, as high as a mountain, if you stacked the, the record, the written record of their sinful activities, it's as high as a mountain. And in an instant, by Lord Chaitanya's mercy, Lord Nityananda's mercy. They were washed clean of everything, became great saintly devotees, received devotional service, the benediction of devotional service. So sometimes we're practicing devotional service. We don't really have a very clear formed um, experience of devotion. It's mixed with a lot of other things. We still have some anger or fear or jealousy or attachments. It's mixed with a lot of different things. But we're practicing under the guidance of an elevated devotee, of an advanced devotee. And by practicing in the association of devotees and gradually, gradually become cleaned because devotional service is that powerful that it's it's very powerful. The, um, it's like the sunlight, you know, in the morning it comes up maybe a little slowly, there's some dawn, a little light in the sky, and then very soon it's fully visible and everything is lit up. So we may be practicing and we're in a still a little bit of a conditioned state. Um, Prabhupada has said like uh, a fan it was plugged in the wall and the blades are going around. That's material engagement. And then you pull the plug out by engaging in devotional service and avoiding uh, sinful activity. But the blade still goes around a little bit. It takes a while for it to unwind. So you don't want to plug back in. But it's unplugged, but it's still going around a little bit. The blades takes a little while for it to stop. 
So sometimes we're practicing devotional service and our experience is always ecstatic, but it may, it may be a lot of other things still in there. And then if gradually, gradually, I mean, by good association, and then we start to become cleared of the um, unwanted things, the anartas, and then we can really taste the devotional. We get a taste for devotion, devotional service. And that taste increases, and it grows, and it grows. And uh, so that's what Narada is asking for. Please give us this benediction of devotional service. We can take up this path where we can develop our actual love for the Lord, attachment for the Lord, because that's what will take us home. (laughs) That's the only thing that will take us back to Godhead, really is devotional service, love for the Lord. If you don't have that, then you're not in touch with the divine energy there, the superior energy. You don't have to engage in the inferior energy, which is separated from the Lord and is illusory. So, how merciful the great sages and saints are that they're giving guidance and association in here, like here, we're hearing from Sugadev Goswami as he's in his um, he's presenting the Bhagavatam in this devo- pure devotional service to Maharaj Pariksit, who is the perfect hearer. Sugadev Goswami is the qualified speaker, and Pariksit Maharaj is the qualified hearer. In order for these messages of Godhead to be transmitted. There needs to be a qualified speaker and a qualified hearer. And the transmission takes place. So Sugadev Goswami Maharaj Prikshit. And he is, Sugadev is repeating the devotional prayers of Narada Muni as he's offering them to Naranarisha, Naranarayan, personality of Godhead. And A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami is translating this for us. So we're hearing from the pure devotee, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami. And then we try to follow. We try to hear nicely. And if we can repeat, we try to repeat nicely. And in this way, that make our connection with the devotional, devotional service. So Prabhupada's commentary. The Lord advises in Bhagavad Gita, Manmana Bhava Madbhakto, Madhyaji Mam Namaskaru, the perfect yoga system consists of always thinking of Krishna, always engaging in devotional service, always worshiping Krishna, always offering obeisances unto him. Unless we practice this yoga system, our illusory attachment for this bad body, which is full of stool and urine, is impossible to give up. The perfection of yoga consists of giving up attachment for this body and bodily relationships and transferring that attachment to Krishna. We are very attached to material enjoyment, but when we transfer that same attachment to Krishna, we traverse the path of liberation. One has to practice this yoga system and none other. Hmm. As Prabhupada has said in other places, Impossible is a word in a fool's dictionary. But here he says, it is impossible to give up this material attachment without developing Krishna consciousness. Always. And practicing this devotional yoga system, bhakti yoga. He says it is impossible without devotional service for bhakti yoga. And it's more than liberation because it's not just a matter of giving up attachment for the body and body relationships, but it is acknowledging as the nature of the spirit soul to be attached, either attached to the material energy or attached to Krishna. So it's simply a matter of switching that attachment and attachment um, is the direction of it comes from desire 
and then we just change the objects of our desire instead of desiring uh, material sense gratification through the vehicle of the material mind and senses and the material sense objects to experience that way and become attached in that way through our desire to switch our desire to Krishna to desire Krishna consciousness to engage in devotional service to the Lord we get a higher taste we do that by hearing about Krishna serving Krishna remembering Krishna worshiping Krishna and we get a higher taste why? because Krishna begins to reveal more of himself and he's the reservoir of all pleasure he's the source of all creation he's the source of the material sense objects he's the source of the of the material senses he's the source of the demigods he's the he's the cause of all causes we make that connection that's really plugging in <laughs> we find the source of all energy Krishna we plug in there oh that's that's what we want to do we want to make that connection and that connection is made through devotional energy not material energy text 16 in the tract of land known as Bhartavarsha, as in Ilavritavarsha, there are many mountains and rivers, and some of the mountains are known as Malaya, Mangalaprasta, Mainaka, Trikuta, Rishaba, Kutika, Kolaka, Saya, Sevagiri, Rishamuka, Sri Shaila, Venkata, Mahendra, Varidara, Vinja, Shuktiman, Rikshagiri, Pariyatra, Drona, Chitrakuta, Govardhan, Raivatika, Kakubda, Nila, Gokamuka, Indrakila, and Kamagiri. So that's some of the mountains in Bhartavarsa. Besides these, there are many hills with many large and small rivers flowing from their slopes. So we're getting to see a little of the geography of Bhartavarsa. And these are some more of the descriptions of the geography. Two of the rivers, the Brahmaputra and the Sona, are called Nadas, or main rivers. These are other great rivers that are very prominent. Trandavasa, Tamraparni, Avatoda, Kritamala, Vayahayasi, Kavera, Veni, Payasvini, Sarkaravarta, Tangabhadra, Krishnavenya, Bhimarati, Godavari, Nirvinja, Payoshna, Tapi, Reva, Shursa, Narmada, Charmavati, Mahanadi, Veda Shmiti, Rikshakulya, Trishama, Kaushika, Mandakini, Yamuna, Saraswati, Drisavati, Gomati, Sarayu, Rodhaspati, Saptavati, Sushoma, Saturdu, Chandrabhaga, Marudrita, Vitasta, Ashikni, and Vishva. The inhabitants of Bharatavarsa are purified because they always remember these rivers. Sometimes they chant the names of these rivers as mantras. And sometimes they go directly to the rivers to touch them and bathe in them. Thus the inhabitants of Vartavarsa become purified. Papa's commentary. All these rivers are transcendental. Therefore one can be purified by remembering them, touching them, or bathing in them. This practice is still going on. We see some some recognizable a lot of these rivers I don't recognize their names but I do recognize Yamuna and Saraswati I do recognize those rivers and they are accessible if you go to India you can bathe in the Yamuna 
You can bathe in the Saraswati, and there are bathing ghats there, places where people go to worship and meditate on Krishna by remembering these transcendental rivers. Text 19. The people who take birth in this tract of land are divided according to the qualities of material nature. The modes of goodness, sattvagun, passion, rajagun, and ignorance, tamagun. Some of them are born as exalted personalities. Some are ordinary human beings, and some are extremely abominable. For in Bhartavarsa, one takes birth exactly according to one's past karma. If one's position is ascertained by a bona fide spiritual master, and one is properly trained to engage in the service of Lord Vishnu, according to the four social visions, Brahman, Kshatriya, Vaishya, and Sudra, and the four spiritual divisions, Brahmachari, Grihastha, Vanaprastha, and Sanyas, one's life becomes perfect. And that was referred to earlier also that in Bharata Varsa, the Varnashram system, Varnashram Dharma system, is one of the advantages of the, uh, for the residents of Bharata Varsa because it allows for gradual progress in spiritual life. And that's available in Bharata Varsa, which seems to indicate that it's really not available in the other Varsas so much. It's not mentioned there, but it's specifically highlighted that this is one of the special features and that even if it seems to disappear for a while or isn't manifest very nicely, it can be brought forth. Uh, it can be brought out again. And it, it's part of one of the features, which is interesting because it's just, the description is here of the mountains and the rivers, and they are part of the geography of Bhartavarsa. And now here also, there's a social uh, structure that's available in Vartavarsa, just like the rivers and the mountains are there. Well, this social uh, structure has been is engineered into this, this area of Bhartavarsa. And we're hearing from Narada Muni in his prayers to Naranarayan, who is always uh, available and meditate in, med in um, Bhattarik Ashram or at least till the end of the millennium. He said that he's present there till the end of the millennium. And a millennium is, I believe, a thousand yuga cycles is one millennium. So well, that's a pretty long time. <laughs> Prabhupada's commentary. For further information, one should refer to Bhagavad Gita. Srila Ramanujacharya writes in his book, and there's a lot of Sanskrit there. I'm, I'm going to skip it over. It's not, even, it's not verse, it's prose. But Prabhupada is quoting Ramanuja Charya about Varnashram. And then another quote from the Vishnu Purana that the sage Parasara Muni has recommended. And there's some more translation. There's more Sanskrit there. I'm just going to read the translation. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Vishnu, is worshipped by the proper execution of prescribed duties in the system of Varna and Ashram. There is no other way to satisfy the Lord. So this was uh, Parasar Muni in the uh, Purana. It's a very ancient scripture, Vishnu Purana. Of course, we know that Lord Chaitanya's appearance um, has made it possible because in Kali Yuga, the Varnashram system is so uh, so deteriorated that it's an emergency. And Lord Chaitanya has made it very simple that because of the difficulties there in, in trying to execute Varnashram Dharma in this age, if people chant Hare Krishna, hear about Krishna, and engage to whatever degree they can in devotional service to the Lord, then that will actually satisfy the Lord. And that's coming from the Lord himself. But here we can see the significance of the Varnashram system. And the Acharyas, they would like to see this. They want to see this 
to whatever degree is possible reinstated because it's for the benefit of everyone, not everyone will be able to take up the chanting of Hare Krishna. But if they can be engaged, because they're too stuck in the modes, if they can be engaged according to their natural propensities, then human society will become more peaceful and then there will be an opportunity for persons to make more advancement so that they're not always in complete distress about where they're going to get their next meal or where they're going to spend the night or they're going to have to live on a bench or something. Then they can, their material necessities are provided for without unnecessary endeavor and then the thievery stops, a lot of the, the stealing and the like this because people are destitute so they they end up becoming thieves become angry because government is not providing for them what they need and basically what they need is to be engaged in the kind of work that they do according to their nature and then they can provide for themselves and they have the opportunity to hear uh, from the devotees of the Lord and the Lord's representatives and begin to make some advancements. So the Varnashram system is very, very important for human society and it's available in Bharata Varsa. And there's remnants of it in the present area referred to as Bharata Varsa, which is India and the Acharyas in line of disciplic succession very much want India to begin to be able to exhibit and manifest this form of very good government of the Varnashram system. So this is another part of Lord Chaitanya's mission, is to revive the um, good government. As he says, whenever I appear, I appear to um, get rid of the troublemakers and miscreants and to protect the devotees. So that's part of the Varnashram does that. It's part of the Kshatriya's service is to protect the citizens with the guidance of the Brahmins who uh, have that uh, they're empowered and they have that potency to guide according to Varnashram Dharma. They can guide the Kshatriyas for the smooth running of society. So we know Lord Chaitanya has come, his mission is to develop Krishna consciousness on the whole planet. And part of that is Varnashram Dharma. In the land of Bharata Varsha, Prabhupada continues, the institution of Varnashram Dharma may be easily adopted. At the present moment, certain demoniac sections of the population of Bharata Varsha are disregarding the system of Varnashram Dharma. Because there's no institution to teach people how to become Brahmins, Kshatriyas, Vaishyas, and Sudras, or Brahmacharis, Grihastas, Vanaprastas, and Sanyas, these demons want a classless society. This is resulting in chaotic conditions. In the name of secular government, unqualified people are taking the supreme governmental posts. No one is being trained to act according to the principles of Ranashram Dharma. And thus people are becoming increasingly degraded and are heading in the direction of animal life. The real aim of life is liberation, but unfortunately the opportunity for liberation is being denied to people in general, and therefore the human lives are being spoiled. The Krishna Consciousness Movement, however, is being propagated all over the world to re-establish Ranashram Dharma system and save human society from gliding down to hellish life. So the, the problems for Varnashram Dharma system are not simply external, they're also internal, in that unqualified persons are not only taking the government in the direction of uh, classless society or communism, but they're taking, but these unqualified persons have also taken posts within Varnashram society. 
unqualified Brahmins and misunderstanding what Varnashram itself is by um, insisting that it's according to birth. But it's not according to birth. Birth can be an important factor because from early childhood a person can be exposed to uh, training. They're off to a good start. To be a Brahmin or a Kshatriya, they're off to a good start, or a Vaisha, or even a Sudra, a good Sudra. Good Sudra is very valuable. <laughs> Need Sudras. Who's going to, you know, assist everybody else? You can't do it by yourself. You need a good assistant. Good assistant is very valuable. <laughs> but by insisting that it's the caste that one is born into and completely disregarding qualifications, because someone may be born in a Brahmin family to Brahmin parents, but not have Brahminical qualities. It is possible, and it does happen. So that's not the only qualification. It's a consideration. Well, they were born, let's see. But if they're qualified for some other type of work, uh, Vaisha or Sudra, then that is their, that is where they need to be for their own happiness and for the smooth running of society. But that is being disregarded and people are falsely proud of taking birth in a certain family, but they don't have the qualifications. So that's also a problem. So Lord Chaitanya is, the Lord is coming, and that is part of the mission of the Krishna Consciousness Movement, is that people should understand what the actual Varnashram system is. And it's not just for the smooth running of society, it's for directing everything toward liberation and beyond. Mm -hmm. At least in the direction of liberation, for a start, <laughs> but beyond liberation, devotional service. That everything is, should be according to one's quality, natural, inherent qualities that one has according to this birth, that they should be used not just for the smooth running of society and sense gratification and economic development and even liberation or religiousness, but is ultimately meant for taking one to the platform of being able to perform devotional service. So, Hare Krishna, Jai, Lord Chaitanya's Sankirtan movement, <laughs>